Church, such an honor to be here with you this morning. Thank you, honey, for leading, uh, leading in that song. And thank you, worship team, for leading us. And uh, even the children who um, wave the branches. It's tough to do that, you know, when everybody's looking at you. And um, isn't, that a, isn't that a fun part of the service to get to uh, participate and to watch Uh, Wow, what an honor to be here with you this morning. Uh, Let me just greet you on behalf of um, our executive director, Brian Autry, and the over 800 other brother and sister churches uh, across Virginia. We link arms together to try to get the gospel to places where it is not um, adequately represented. And churches like yours help us to do that. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, praying for and giving to the Annie Armstrong missions offering as well. Uh, In addition to Uh, stories just like the video that we watched and heard. I know this past week we had four different church planting teams uh, right here in Virginia that were together and going through some training so that they could launch out and start new works all across Virginia. And the need is great. I know it seems like there's a church on every corner in some of our uh, parts of the, the, the state, but there are many parts of the state where there's not even a church preaching in a language that people can understand. So thank you for your uh, giving to that and being a part of that. And, and um, I loved, I, I noticed uh, when I was um, taking a little tour of the church this morning, the map on the wall and the, the different ways that your church is engaged all across the world. And that's such an encouragement. So, so thank you for that. Uh, it is a great pleasure, like I said, to be here. Uh, this is my wife, Wendy. We have three children. They're all grown now and out of the house. So we're living that good life. <laughs> and... Uh, and um, so I do get to serve as your regional strategist, regional missionary, I think better describes it, but um, I just go by whatever title they give me. And so um, I'm a regional strategist and I also coordinate our relief ministries. So disaster relief, if you are familiar with some of the work we do that, I get to coordinate those efforts across our state. And um, lots of great stuff I could share, but the greatest thing I can share is just to be able to preach a message out of God's Word for you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you and ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. We are celebrating Palm Sunday today. And of course, as has been so wonderfully showed to us already, uh, it is that Sunday that Jesus entered into Jerusalem uh, for the last time in His earthly ministry. And uh, He was greeted by the crowds crying, Hosanna, came in on the coal of a donkey, the foal of a donkey, excuse me. And um, and so he was greeted with applause. And yet we know just a few days later, he would uh, we humanity would turn our backs and and uh, on him and that he would die on the cross. Um, And um, one of the saddest days the world has known, yet he gave himself willingly to that. And we know just a couple days later that he rose from the dead and We get to celebrate that next week. Uh, But between now and then, we get to contemplate what happened in those days between uh, him entering into Jerusalem and then uh, dying on the cross. And um, as we do that, let me just tell you a story that I came across this morning, actually, uh, on the Internet. Apparently, in 1980, there was a man who bought a piece of... uh, imitation costume jewelry, imitation diamond at a yard sale. He paid $13 for it. And as the closer he looked at it, uh, he knew something about jewelry. He thought it may not be costume jewelry at all. And so he brought it to some experts and they looked at it and they confirmed his suspicions. Eventually it ended up at Sotheby's Fine Jewels in the United Kingdom and they closely examined it. And they determined several things. First of all, that it was indeed not costume jewelry, but a real diamond. Uh, Second of all, it was very old from the 1800s, probably worn at one time by royalty. And third, they determined that it had a total weight of 26 carats and was probably worth over $400,000. By the time the auction ended, the piece of $13 costume jewelry sold for $850,000. Pretty good buy at a garage sale. Not only was it a stunning buy, but it was also a great example of how people can grossly underestimate 
the value of something. And as we read this passage this morning, we're going to find that same exact thing happens here in Scripture. So beginning in verse 6, uh, well, let me, I tell you, let me, let me just stop for just a second and give you a little bit of background. This passage that we're going to read, how Jesus, you're familiar with it, I'm sure, is anointed by this expensive ointment at Bethany by this woman named Mary. Um, before we read that, I want you just to know a few background things. Number one uh, is that the story is told in three of our uh, three of our gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or Matthew, Mark, and John. Excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and John all tell this story of this woman who anoints Jesus with this expensive ointment. And uh, from John and from Mark, we get some details that we don't get here. So we're going to cover that when we get there. But one of them is that we find out all the additional people who are there. Uh, we find the names, people like Lazarus, who had been brought back, raised from the dead. And, and Simon, who was a leper, now throwing a, a dinner party. Uh, we know the disciples were there, those who had seen all the miracles of Jesus and, and were familiar with uh, the feeding of the thousands and Jesus walking on, on uh, water and, and all of those uh, things. Uh, but um, so keeping all that in mind, uh, also recall that uh, this story takes place in the middle of two book, bookends. One of them that comes right before the story is that the chief priests and elders have decided now that they're going to stealthily arrest Jesus and kill him. So this is, this is a, becoming a very dark time. There's a, there's a pivot that happens here. Uh, Jesus had entered into the, you know, the, the, the adoration of the crowds, but now there are those that are the spiritual, the religious leaders who've decided that's enough is enough. We're going we're gonna to somehow figure out how to stealthily arrest him and kill this guy. That's at the beginning of the story. At the end of the story, one of Jesus' own decides he's going to betray him into the hands of, of these who want him dead, Judas. So in, in between these two bookends, we read this story of Jesus being anointed by Mary at Bethany. So let's read with me in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through through 13. I'll read, and then you can follow along with me. It says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is live. It is alive and it is active. It is powerful. Lord, as we read your word, it, uh, it reads us. And it allows us to see the world the way that uh, you see it. And so we pray, Lord, as we sit underneath, under the teaching of your word today, that you would open our hearts to hear what you'd have us to hear. And that your Holy Spirit would apply the truth to our lives and that you would do what only you can do and that you would uh, fashion us more into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we not be like those who see the value of, or who see something that's valuable and yet fail to see how valuable that it is. So we pray that you would enlighten us this morning, that you give us the, the, uh, the power to live our lives in light of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I want to show you how in God's Word, this passage makes the case that Jesus is worth it. That Jesus is, is worth, and you can fill in the blank of it with anything. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. You see, it says in verse 7 that a woman came to him, 
We know that this woman is Mary from Mark and John's account. There's, there's at least five Marys in the New Testament. Uh, this Mary is Mary who's the sister of Martha and whose brother Lazarus has been raised from the dead. It says that she came to him with an alabaster vial of very expensive ointment. We also know that from John's account that these were all together, they had all come together to have a dinner in honor of Jesus. That they were there to celebrate Jesus and who he was and his teaching and all of his ministry and everything that he meant to them. Picturing who else was there? Simon, the leper. They were in the house of a leper. Lepers didn't throw dinner parties. Lepers were unclean by the Old Testament law. Uh, often there were many skin diseases that were called leprosy and they were often infectious. Uh, we don't know the exact ins and outs of all of these diseases, but certainly uh, they would not be able to invite people in their home and oftentimes they would not be able to go outside of their home or, or except in very specific ways and uh, having to call out unclean, unclean as they went out so that um, they would not... Um, spread their skin disease to others. So Simon the leper is there. We learn that Jesus, that Lazarus was there. Can you imagine uh, how different it would have been? Here Lazarus who had been dead four days and, um, and yet now he was here in this uh, room having a, a dinner uh, party for, for Jesus. The sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Mary, the one who was mad at Jesus because he didn't get there earlier. She was there, and um, she was the one bringing this alabaster jar of ointment to him. Uh, Peter, James, and John were there in this room. Just a little earlier, Peter, James, and John had been on the mountain with Jesus and seen him transfigured right before their very eyes. And they saw Elijah and Moses appear with Jesus, and they heard the very voice of God saying, This is my son with whom I am uh, with whom I am well pleased, and I take delight in him. Listen to him. And of course, the rest of the disciples were there. Those, they, seen the, they had seen the working of the, all of the miracles, the healings, uh, the, the authority with which Jesus taught, the casting out of demons. They were, so in this room, we, are, we, are, we see at least 14 men and two women who were present at this dinner in honor of Jesus. And it is in that setting that the Bible tells us that she comes to Jesus with this very expensive alabaster vial. You see, if, if, if we're going to make the case that Jesus is worthy, that Jesus is worth it in spite of the cost, we need to understand the cost a little bit. Uh, and in this kind of, this actual kind of uh, ointment was not uncommon in this era. Wealthy homes would have it, perhaps even as a, a hand-me-down sort of thing from generation to generation. And they would use it for different things from, from uh, anointing special guests who would come into their home uh, to maybe even being part of sacred ceremonies, weddings, funerals, etc. It, it was something that would be an heirloom. Uh, and not only was what was in it expensive, but the very vessel that held it would be expensive as well. Alabaster is um, a kind of stone that uh, is easily carvable. Uh, it's a beautiful stone. It's translucent. Uh, light can go through it. And it, sometimes it's veined and has different colors in it. And so just the very vessel itself would be considered something that was, was uh, very valuable. And yet, uh, uh, that wasn't the only thing that made it costly. Uh, what was in the stone, what was in this vessel, Mark and John describe as, quote, pure and expensive nard, this ointment. Uh, the essence of the ointment was derived from an aromatic herb that was grown in the high pasture land of the Himalayas. Now, you may not be great at geography, but you probably know that the Himalayas are not real close to the Middle East. In fact, where this, this substance originated from is about 3,000 miles as the crow flies from, this, from where it is right now, from where Mary has, it, has possession of it. It would have had to have been uh, created and then carried on camel's back through miles and miles of, 
mountain passes. So it was, it was very high priced indeed. The cost of this way of honoring Jesus was extravagantly expensive. Uh, yet Jesus is worth it. Worth it. We know because when we get down to the end of the passage, Jesus commends her for this action. That Jesus says what she has done is fitting. It's good. It's beautiful. And wherever the gospel is told, what she has done for me today will also be told. So we know that what she gave is expensive, and we know that what she did was good. And it wasn't expensive just because of what it was or the vessel that carried it. It was expensive because of the way that she gave it. You see, when these things were held on by a family and used, they'd be used for over years and years, maybe even generations and generations. And yet, when Mary took her vial, her box of ointment, she broke it and she poured it out all over Jesus. She used it up all at one time in one extravagant expression of love and, and honor to Jesus. Many times uh, these kinds of vessels, as, as um, archaeologists have discovered them, would have long, narrow necks so that the, the top of the neck could either be broken off or, or like a cap could be removed and the substance would just be trickled, would just trickle out. And they would just use a little bit, a little bit at a time. And yet Mary would not have been satisfied by that sort of action. She wasn't there to honor Jesus with a little bit of what she had. She honored Jesus with all that she had. She honored Jesus uh, in a way that to those who were looking at her seemed foolish. She poured it out onto Jesus. Imagine what the aroma must have been like in that room. Must have smelled really, really good. I don't have any great examples of something like that, but I do have a negative example of that. Um, my wife used to run these musicals at our church, music camps, and every now and again, seems like every year I'd get volunteered into playing one of the parts of that. And I remember this one year, I was uh, voluntold that I was going to be, uh, I was going to play the part of a fisherman uh, as I don't remember even what the musical was all about, but I was a fisherman and I was trying to ham it up a little bit because I like to be a ham sometimes. And so I thought to make it more authentic, I needed a real fish. And so um, I did what all men do when they need a fish. I went to Walmart <laughs> and I went to the seafood section. I bought a trout from, from Walmart and um, I put it on a stringer and then I would sling it over my back and I'd come on the stage and I'd do my part and of course we practice every every afternoon we practice all the kids would learn you know that we'd practice Monday through Friday Monday through Thursday and on Friday we would do the musical for all the parents and so I practiced on Monday I put the fish in the freeze the fridge and then I took it out on Tuesday and practiced on Tuesday and I put it back in the fridge and then I took it out on Wednesday and I practiced on Wednesday and I put it back and then on Thursday and then on Friday and by the time Friday night got there that fish was smelling pretty ripe. I mean it was it was only out of the refrigerator for about 15 or 20 minutes but uh, at a time but man it was it was really smelling bad and when I walked out on the stage I don't I don't guess I really understood how bad it was smelling but when I walked out on the stage I could see as the odor hit each row of the church <laughs> I could see everybody's facial expressions they would like try to move back in their pew and move away from it and but before I got off the stage I could see in the back of the auditorium they were getting a whiff of that fish it was, the, the room was completely filled with the stench of fish. In the same way, when Mary broke that bottle of ointment onto Jesus, she did it in a way that the entire room was filled with the smell of that ointment. The entire room understood how much she esteemed Jesus. In fact, if you read this account in John and in Mark, it's interesting because they focus on different parts of Jesus' body. Matthew says that she anointed his head. John says that she anointed his feet. 
And Jesus summarized her action in chapter 26, verse 12, by saying that she had poured out the fragrant oil on his body. And it's clear from this passage that Jesus gave her worship. She esteemed Jesus in such a way that he was completely covered in her estimation of him. He was completely covered with evidence that she loved Jesus. She gave her worship to Jesus without holding anything back and without being able to take anything back. I don't know if you've ever used cologne, men, or perfume, but once you spray it, you can't put it back in the bottle, can you? And Jesus received this gift from Mary in a way that he, he could not give it back to her. She, the Word is teaching us this morning that regardless of the cost, Jesus is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Not only is, is, is Jesus worthy in spite of the cost, but He's also worthy in spite of the critics. You see, it says in verses 8 and 9 that when the disciples saw this, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. You see, the, the way that Mary honored Jesus brought criticism from the disciples, from those who were in the room, because the disciples understood the value of the perfume better than they did the value of the person in the room that they were honoring. The disciples said, this is a waste. That word waste there means to squander something. It means to treat something with utter disregard for its value. They were accusing Mary of not understanding, not understanding the value of the substance that she gave him. In John, he indicates that it was Judas, actually, who was leading the charge for the disciples. Judas says in John's account of this, this episode that the, the perfume could have been sold uh, for 300 denarii, almost a year's wages, is what this perfume was worth. I did a little uh, investigation and um, discovered that in 2024, the average annual income per person in Virginia was between 47 and 55,000. Some make more, some make less. On average, it's between 47 and 55,000 dollars. Imagine spending that much money on a on a bottle of perfume. I thought, I got to thinking, is that even possible? Well, it turns out it is. <laughs> the world's most expensive perfume is something called Imperial Majesty. Currently, the fragrance is priced at $12,700 per ounce. At that price, with the average Virginia annual salary, you could buy enough to fit in a four ounce container. Four ounces is what you can carry on uh, liquid that you can carry on an aircraft uh, in your carry-on bag. So imagine spending a year's salary on four ounces of perfume, and then imagine your spouse slapping you when you got home. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what, that's what, in essence, you can identify a little bit, can't you, with the disciples? Like, wow, is that really the best use of that? Well, and the reality is, and the irony is, that Mary seems to be the only person in the room who is actually aware of the value of the one for whom they're throwing the dinner party. You have Lazarus there, who had been dead four days. You have Simon there, who had never thrown a dinner party before. You have Peter, James, and John, who had just heard the voice of God saying, this is my son whom I delight in. Listen to him. We're not aware, or at least it doesn't share with us, any of any gifts that any of them bring. Only Mary. And to some observers, it might seem ob the obvious needs of others were all around them. There were poor people all around them. They said for this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. So I asked myself, where, where did they go wrong? Where did the disciples go wrong? How could they have missed it? How could they miss what 
Mary had done, how could they have not applauded her or worshipped Jesus because of what she was doing? And yet they missed it. And I don't think they got it wrong because they overvalued the poor. I don't think they got that wrong. Poor are, people are important to God and to Jesus. The Old Testament is filled with all kinds of regulations about how they were to help the poor. Um, and so they weren't, Jesus often went to the poor and helped the poor. So they didn't get that part wrong. They didn't get it wrong when they thought about the value of the perfume. They didn't overvalue the perfume. They got that part right. They knew what it was worth. What they got wrong is they didn't esteem, they did not correctly value Jesus. They didn't understand the value of the one that was in the room with them. And, and as you think about this, in our lives, when we try to live our lives in a way that, that shows his value, when, when we answer the question, is Jesus worth it? And we answer it rightly, and we live our lives according to that, it often causes confusion among the people who don't really value Jesus the way that we might, doesn't it? It often looks like foolishness, in fact. Um, somebody decides, you know, I thought I was going to be an engineer when I grew up, but God's calling me to be a youth pastor. Maybe people think, man, is that really what, you know, is that really a smart move? You know, it depends if Jesus is God or not, <laughs> you know? It depends if, if teaching young people how to be a follower of Jesus is, is, is a worthwhile investment or not. See, when we esteem Jesus rightly, it can cause confusion to other people. But Jesus is worth it regardless of the cost and, and regardless of the critics. Jesus is worth it because of who he is and what he came to do. And this is where Jesus speaks into this situation and Jesus corrects their thinking, and I think also Jesus can correct our thinking into helping us correctly esteem Him. Jesus starts off by pointing out the rightness of what Mary had done. Look at verses 10 through 13 with me. It says that, But Jesus, but Jesus aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you will always have the poor, for, for you will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Jesus said that she had done a good deed to me. Some of your translations might say noble thing, she's done a noble thing, or that she's done a beautiful thing. Really, it's a word that has two basic shades of meaning. It can mean something that is beautiful or something that is fitting. Um, and so, uh, for instance, the word good, when you think of uh, something, it means something that is fitting for its purposes. So when you think of good fruit, good fruit is good when you can eat it, and it brings nutrition into your body. It's good. The fruit is fitting for its purpose. It's fitting because you can eat it and it helps your body. Good fruit is bad, or I mean, excuse me, bad fruit is bad when you can't eat it. Either it's rotten or it tastes terrible or it doesn't give nutrition to your body. Jesus says, what this woman has done for me is good in the sense that it is fitting. It is fitting in this situation. It is helpful in this situation. It is appropriate in this situation. See, Mary is commended because what she has done ha is good. And there's a couple reasons why it's good. The first reason is because of who she did it for. Jesus said, she did it for me. If Mary had come into that room and broke that, that jar all over Judas, he probably wouldn't have complained as much. <laughs> You know, but it wouldn't have been good in that situation because they weren't there to honor Judas. They were there to honor Jesus. And it was fitting that she honored him in that way. You see, the king of glory was living among them. The one that would soon die on the cross was now eating at their table. In Isaiah 66, verse 1, it says this, 
This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house could you possibly build for me? And what place could be my home? And yet here Jesus is sitting at their table. Sitting in the home of a former leper. The God of the universe deserves so much better than that. And yet Jesus commended her because she honored him in this humble, humble situation, in this humble estate that he found himself in, this humble state that he found himself in. Her actions were targeted at Jesus. And so it, it made what she was doing fitting for the occasion. But it was also fitting, not just because of who it was pointed to, but because of the time that it was. Jesus says, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Jesus is not saying, don't care about the poor. He's saying, this temporary situation, this window in time where I'm dwelling among you earthlings, this window is closing in just a few days. He would be crucified. In less than 50 days, he will have ascended into heaven. And so there is a timing issue that Mary understood and that Jesus commended her for. Mary's act of worship, if, if you want maybe a little bit of a crude um, example, was, was like an investment. It was like an early investment of worship in Jesus when his stock was really low. You see, the, Jesus here is an earthling. The Word has become flesh and dwelled among us. And Mary understood this. In 2009, the first cryptocurrency was invented called Bitcoin. Maybe you've heard of Bitcoin. I don't fully understand cryptocurrency. I just know it's a thing. And um, that's all about what I know of it. When it was first invented, it was essentially worthless. Uh, it's a, it was worth about one-tenth of one cent for Bitcoin. A year later, the very first purchase was made using Bitcoin. Two pizzas were purchased for 10,000 Bitcoin. Okay, so its, it's stock is really low at this point. In, two, in 2024, this year, one Bitcoin is valued at approximately $69,000. If you had invested $100 in Bitcoin in 2009, today it would be worth somewhere around $690 million. You see, if, if we would see the seconds and minutes and hours of our days as investments in light of the future glory of Jesus, then there's nothing that we would give or do that would seem foolish. How many of you, if you could go back in time in 2009, wouldn't sell your home, your car, your pets, your shoes, your clothes, everything you own to buy stock, to buy Bitcoin. It might look silly then, but if you could travel back in time and do it, it you wouldn't care how silly it looked. Because you'd be looking forward to 10 or 20 years down the road when you would have the fruits of all that investment, right? Somehow Mary knew this. Mary understood this. Mary, Mary gave the best that she had because she knew that in this moment, it may seem like she's given a lot, but there would, become, there would come a time when even what she was giving her now would not be sufficient, a, a sufficient way to honor Jesus. The reality is that there will, be, there will be a day when Jesus comes back that all the flowers that have ever bloomed from the beginning of time couldn't be brought together and created, create a perfume worthy enough to honor him appropriately. And yet here she was. She was honoring Jesus the best way that she could with the best that she had. Mary made, what Mary did made no sense except that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was there in her midst and that he would soon take the place of the Passover lamb and would die for her sin. And a good question to ask herself this morning is, does the way I live cause confusion to people who don't know Christ? 
Because if it doesn't, then we're probably not living for Christ in the way that we should. If everything about our lives makes sense apart from Jesus being God, then we're probably not living for Christ the way that we ought to live. We ought to do things that seem crazy sometimes because of Christ. We ought to go out to restaurants and tip our waitresses and our waiters in ways that don't make sense because Jesus treats us in ways that don't make sense. We ought to do sacrificial, loving things for people that don't deserve it because Jesus did sacrificial, loving things for us when we didn't deserve it. You see, Jesus is worthy not just because of who He is, but also because of what He did. Jesus, in the correcting of their thinking, He said that what she did was fitting not just because of the timing, but because of who He was and what He came to do. He said, For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Her action was good because of its target. It was done to Him and for Him. And it was done because of what He was going to do for her. You know, as we uh, close this morning, I'm sure in this room most of you, if any of you, if not all of you, would agree that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy of whatever. Fill in the blank. He's worthy of my time. He's worthy of my, my effort. He's worthy of my energy. He's worthy of my, my treasure. He's worthy of... He's worthy of all that we have and all that we are. 2,000 years ago, a woman from the Middle East understood this. She understood His worth. My question, though, is... Do, do we understand it? Do, do you understand it? Do you remember it? If you're like me, then you need a reminder of this about every day. That it's hard for me to remember when I wake up in the morning that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth getting up out of bed. It's hard for me to remember when I can choose between being comfortable or serving that Jesus is worth it. It's hard to remember when, you know, I feel awkward because I want to, I know that God wants me to speak up for Him. It's, it's worth potentially being criticized for that. And these are just small examples. But the reality is that Jesus is worth it. There'll be a day in the future, I'm going to read a part of that. Just consider for a moment, Mary holding that broken vessel of ointment that she had given to Jesus on that day. And just think, remember the criticisms that the disciples had about the way that she gave that. And, and in light of that, I'm going to read this portion of Scripture that you're probably familiar with in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. When John paints the picture of a future when all the earth and all the creatures of the earth are worshiping the same Jesus that Mary gave some perfume to. And how ridiculous it seemed to the, the disciples then and how ridiculous the disciples' criticism will seem on that day. It says in Revelation 5, verse 11, and we'll close with this. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Started off this morning with a story of a man who bought a $13 <coughs> fake diamond that turned out to be 
worth a lot more than that. The reality is that we have this precious thing, this precious person called Jesus. And so often we treat him like he's a $13 piece of costume jewelry. Uh, and that we'll give him away for next to nothing. We'll, we'll lay it down and we'll completely disregard who he is and what he's done. He's worth way more than almost anything we can say. He's worthy of this description in Revelation chapter 5 when every creature on heaven and earth and under the earth fall down in utter worship of him. He's worthy of that. And it's our, it's our job in this part of our lives, this reality that we live in earth, to honor him now like he will one day be honored in the future. Because I promise you this, whatever we do for him now, we won't regret on that day. The trick is to live our lives today like we will that day wish we had done. So this morning, my challenge and my encouragement, my reminder to myself and to you is to don't undervalue Jesus today, but honor him. Value him today because he is worthy. Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for Mary. Thank you for this follower of yours who, Lord, may have been one of the best listeners you ever had. This Mary who sat at your feet and listened even while her sister was serving. Thank you for, Lord, the way that she understood your value. Not that she overestimated, Lord, but God, that she correctly understood that you are worth all that we have and all that we are. In order, I pray that you would give me the eyes of Mary, the, the perspective, God, of, of your true worth, of the value that you have. Lord, may I not hold on to anything that I have that you want to use. Lord, I thank you for your word and how it can uh, read our minds and read our hearts and, and help us to understand, Lord, how we need to be um, brought back onto the, the, the correct understanding. Um, and so I pray this morning, Lord, as you have been here with us, as you have uh, taught us um, through your spirit, Lord, that you would apply this to our lives. And uh, Lord, if nothing else, that we would worship you in the way that you deserve. And Lord, that that might play itself out in our lives tomorrow and, and even this week as we celebrate this holy week. Um, God, help us, to, help us to allow it to make real practical changes in our lives so that um, we, would, we would live our life in light of the fact that Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of it all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.